Amen. What a way to start our morning. The, you just sang, we just sang some of my favorite lyrics of all, ta- of all time. There's no wall you won't kick down to come after me. That's the love of God. What a beautiful picture of that. Well, I am super excited this morning to introduce our guest speaker to you. His name is Tyler Reagan. Tyler Reagan for the last five years has been the president of Catalyst. And if you don't know much about Catalyst, Catalyst is growing up the next generation of Christian leaders across our country. Every year in Atlanta, they have hold a conference for young leaders and emerging leaders. For about 10,000, our staff just got back from the West Coast Catalyst with thousands more. Catalyst, in my opinion, is doing more to shape our country for Jesus Christ than any other entity, any other organization, any other effort out there. They are reminding us as Christians what it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, what it looks like to lead in the name of Jesus Christ, what it looks like to embrace all people. And and then I love how I think they're the most creative group that I've ever interacted with or been a part of. And and a lot of the things that we do at the Grove, the ideas are rooted in something we saw or heard about that went on at Catalyst. Uh, Tyler Reagan has also just come out or has just finished a new book, his first book. It's titled The Life-Giving Leader. He'll be speaking on on some of those ideas. You can order it. It doesn't come out till September, but you can pre-order it on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. But right now, Grove, I need you to get really loud. Give Tyler the warmest, biggest, best welcome you can. There we go. There we go. Tyler, we're so glad you're here, man. Thank you. So Palmer has, uh, I think he's, he's laid the law down that, that we're doing the greatest thing in the world, so that's good. It's a pretty aggressive uh, statement, but thank you, Palmer. Uh, so just so you know, 945, right, last service? No, 915. I got this figured out. Where's my pew people at? Come on, pew people. All right, listen, that's, that, that, that was a pew people response. You're going to have to do better than that. Pew people, you all in this place today? Okay, there we go. All right. So this is, I like to move a lot anyway. So this works out for me, but I'm trying to adjust to the fact. Uh, so if, if there's ever a point in the message that I haven't responded or seen you in a while, just kind of start waving like over here and I'll get to you in a minute. Um, hey, I'm really honored to be here. I hope you know uh, one of the things that you need to know, which is you're in a space where uh, you've got an incredible leadership team and pastor and Palmer and Veronica and the way they love this community. And uh, I'm just grateful to get to know them. And, the, and I've gotten to interact with a lot of the staff here at the Grove. And I, I'll tell you what, there is a passion in the staff and the leadership of this church to impact this community. And it's through you and it's through equipping you. They also told me one other thing that this is the best service. Now, they didn't say that, but I've heard. So listen, I'm mid-afternoon. I'm from Atlanta. So I need you to be in on this, okay? Can we do that? You wake? All right. So um, I get to go. I really do have the privilege of going around. Catalyst start, started... Um, 19 years ago by a guy named John Maxwell. Anybody heard of John Maxwell before? Yep, yeah, if you're over 50, you've probably heard of John Maxwell. The rest of you, he is kind of what we would consider one of the godfathers of leadership, especially Christian leadership and what that looks like. Um, and so he started this thing about uh, 19 years ago that said, what does it look like for us to make sure we always invest in the next generation of leaders? And so we've been doing that for the last 19 years. I've been a part uh, for seven of those. And uh, it's a really amazing thing that I get to go around and get to hang out with some really cool people. And uh, so sometimes, sometimes people say, so how do you stay grounded when you get to hang out with, with cool people? And I said, it's pretty simple. It's because of these three other people right here on this picture. So that's me in the jacket. Um, I'm just making sure that 1045 you're rolling, okay? That's my wife, Carrie. We've been married 17 years, I believe. Um, Nate, my oldest, is 10, about to be 11. He loves basketball and all things basketball. And then uh, my youngest, Charlie there, he is just like me. He's seven, about to be eight. Our birthday, he was actually supposed to be born on my birthday, and I was like, no way. I already shared my birthday with Father's Day. I'm not going to share it with you, son. So he's two days ahead of time. He's, fla- he's a flag day baby, which there aren't very many of those. I'm just It's not a big deal. It's just June 14th. Um, that picture right there explains to you why I'm able to stay grounded because they honestly don't care what I do. They're like, their biggest question to me is, Daddy, wait, are you the boss? That's all they care about, are you the boss? 
And I'm like, I am a boss. No, I'm just kidding. I've never said that. But I should, because that's a pretty good response. Um, they care that I'm at home. They care that I show up at their basketball games and their soccer games. My eight-year-old, I coach his soccer team and uh, coached him to a second place finish. First runner up, which is the first loser, but we weren't bad. <laughs> that's what he cares about. He knows I get to do some amazing things. But here's what uh, I learned this week. I continue to see this principle happen over and over again, that no matter what age you are, you have influence. And so last weekend, uh, happy Mother's Day, by the way, belated Mother's Day to all of you mothers. Um, last Sunday, we had a great day planned. We we're gonna go to church and uh, go to my wife's favorite restaurant. And as we did that, the boys, as you know, uh, most people know that I think it's 18 or 20 that your frontal lobe actually develops to where you have reasoning opportunities. So until then, good luck. So they couldn't reason the fact that their bad mood might affect Mother's Day. Because to them, it's about who? Them. And what I realized pretty quickly is whether they believed it or saw it or not, they could influence through their moods, through their actions, an entire day that was well-planned, well-organized, well, you know, it was all about value and carry. And yet their intentions and their actions actually created a little bit of tension uh, uh, during that day. Now we got through it and we made it through. But my point is, so many people don't recognize that your influence with others is really your leadership. Because so many people I would ask, are you a leader? And they would say, no. So let's do this real quick. How many of you have influence with at least one other person? If you please all raise your hands, that's gotta be all of you. <laughs> so whether you have influence with one other person or 200 people or 2000 people, what I wanna talk about today is how you steward that influence, how you manage that influence impacts the, the world around you. Uh, and for me, what I hope is in a way that brings life to them. Uh, I mentioned John Maxwell earlier. John Maxwell defines leadership as influence. It's that simple. We're gonna keep it that simple. I, I really, my passion for today is that God ignites something in each of you in this room that stirs in your heart this understanding that no matter whether you are the leader or you are someone in a position of influence in your family, with your friends, at work, that he would ignite a realization that you have an opportunity to change the atmosphere, change the environment, and change the lives of the people around you by pouring life into them versus taking life from them. Um, I think there's a lot of people that want to be life-giving in what they do at work, what they do at home, but a lot of people don't do it. And I'm gonna give you three reasons why I think they don't do it. The first one is this. It's harder and it requires more from you. To choose to do this, it's, it's harder. But here's what I believe. I think this is a pretty, I think we'd probably all agree with this, that nothing, or excuse me, everything of value requires sacrifice, right? My wife would say those two boys and birthing them required sacrifice, but it was worth it. It was painful and it hurt, but it was worth it. Some, any graduates in here? I know it's like graduation week. Anybody graduating high school, college? Okay, seven. Palmer, you need to get to work on this. We need some seniors in this place. We got a few, okay. Listen, you're at a stage in life where you, you just finished some hard work, didn't you? You just pushed through and it, it was worth it. It was worth it. But most people have a hard time doing this life-giving idea because it requires more from us. Number two, most of the time, people don't believe they're a leader. I just did a survey on uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook with some folks and I asked if, if you're a Christian, and uh, we were to say the word leader to you, do you think of yourself or do you think of somebody else? And more than half of the people said, I think of somebody else. But what I'm trying to convince you of and let you understand is it's all of us. We all have a leadership responsibility. We all have to or carry our influence, manage our influence in a way that brings life to the people around us. Let's, let's do this for a second. It's easy to think of, or excuse me, it's hard to think of like the healthy versions of this. Everybody take a second and think of one or two people that have had influence on you in probably not a positive way. Think of somebody who has taken life and grace from you because they led so poorly. Can everybody think of that? Do not elbow the person next to you. <laughs> we can think of that, right? 
So we do that, you know, when Palmer was talking about, we do these leadership events. That's the worst place to ask a question like that because usually you're with your boss or you're with, like, and you'll be like, yeah, God's calling you to change your organization. And they're like, I can't, he's right here. <laughs> but it's more of the, did you hear that? That was a really good thought. <laughs> you'll get there. I'm quick. You'll just have to stay with it. <laughs> but the point is most of us don't embrace the fact that we each have a leadership opportunity, right? Here's the third reason I think most people struggle to be a life-giving leader is they haven't embraced their unique God-given um, self. That's a big deal, and that's what we're gonna spend our time talking about. If you wanna know what I wanna drive so deep in the hearts of my two boys so that the rest of their life they can live without being swayed one way or the other on this conversation is that God has uniquely made them. And I wanna talk to you about, I believe, that he's uniquely made us, and that connects to the unique story and the unique purpose he has for our lives. When life flows, influence grows. Let me show you uh, these pictures real quick. Uh, this is a picture of the Grand Canyon from a guy from Atlanta. I thought it was like down the street from here, but apparently it's not. That's Horseshoe Bend, I believe is what it's called. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Everybody know what that river is? The Colorado River, right? That is, I love this picture because the flow of that river has brought such a legacy and a beauty to that place. A constant flow of life from that river has literally changed the entire landscape and created the Grand Canyon. Now, here's what's amazing. Look at the influence where this river started. It's called Lapooter Pass. You can literally stand on either side of it, but that's the beginning of what created the Grand Canyon. And here's what I know, is men and women, students, when you learn and embrace this idea that I'm going to have a leadership legacy, a legacy that counts, that matters because I'm gonna to choose to let life flow from me, it might, it's always gonna start small like that, but over a lifetime of committed to that, you're, gonna, you're going to create a legacy that's beautiful like what we saw at Horseshoe Bend there. Now here's the other option. Influence starts somewhere, but it never starts huge. Um, how many of you have heard of Hillsong? Uh, Hillsong Church is in Sydney, Australia. We just sang, what a beautiful name. Uh, most churches in America are singing Hillsong songs all the time. They have campuses all over the place. Brian, Brian Houston, who's the global uh, pastor there, he just posted this week a picture of sitting in the same seat that he sat 30 years ago overlooking Los Angeles. And as he was overlooking it 30 years ago, he felt like the Lord said, you're gonna have influence in not just this city, but in the United States. And he remembers thinking, how? I have no friends in the US and I have no influence. But a lifetime of trusting that God is who he says he is and being surrendered to this idea that I'm gonna pour my life out to those around me, 30 years later, they're one of the most influential movements of the church across the globe, but even in the US. Their songs are sung everywhere. They just want a Grammy for what a beautiful name it is. The influence started small but over year after year of a faithfulness to that influence, he was able to create a larger influence. What you choose to do with the influence you have with others will either create life flow to those around you or it will create stale, stagnant swamps. Take a look at this picture. Anybody ever worked there? You felt that way before, hadn't you? Think of a place that you've worked, an environment you've been in, a school you've taught at, where life was not flowing into that place. The only things growing you did not want to grow. You know what happens? You know how this happens? You, them, whoever, does something to, to, to literally hinder the flow of life. The, the, the free flow of water and oxygen to that space doesn't come because it's being dammed up somewhere, it's being stopped. And it's creating and growing things that are unhealthy, things that you don't wanna be around. Anybody ever, is that ringing a bell with anybody? I do not, definitely don't elbow this, but have you ever been in a relationship like that? Uh-oh, that would struck a chord. <laughs> Y'all might need to get lunch after this, talk through that. Who wants to be in a place like that? But without intentionally recognizing that flow of life has to come from you out to others, this can happen. This gets dammed up with bitterness, unforgiveness in our hearts, sin in our lives, this stuff can really affect how we're around people. One of the guys I worked for for a while, 
um, I came into the office pretty early into, into working with him. And he said, hey, give me just, and we were good friends. He was like, just tell me what you see right now. And he was like, uh, he said, what are you seeing? I said, well, do you realize that when you walk into the office, everybody in the office is wondering what mood you're in? And he's like, is that bad? <laughs> Apparently you didn't think so. But it's terrible because who wants to be in a place where I'm always on my heels wondering, hey, is the boss in a good mood or not? Because that is truly going to affect my day. Is that life-giving or is that taking life? It's life it, it takes life from you, doesn't it? Because every day you're feeling this tension. What about a home like that? How's dad feeling today? Man, the number of times that's convicted me when I come home from a hard day of work and I realize my two boys and my wife don't deserve for me to bring that home to them because I'm bringing home frustration and anger and what that does is it sets a tone. Well, I don't want every day that the, my sweet 2009 Honda Accord pulls into the driveway that they're going, what dad is showing up today? I know a lot of leaders who put their faith on the sideline when they walk into the office because they say, well, this is business. What would it look like if that business was kingdom business? Now, as you heard, I'm from Atlanta. I drink a lot of Coca-Cola, not zero or diet, and that's a problem. But I also eat a Chick-fil-A about 17 times a week. <laughs> and if it was open today, I would get you all the sweet tea just so we could all share in this together. The Christian chicken is what we call it. So here's the thing about Chick-fil-A. I remember hearing a VP one time say, um, somebody told him, they said, you know, you'd make a whole lot more money if you were open on Sunday. And he said, no, that's actually not true. We make a whole lot more money because we're closed on Sunday. That's a kingdom idea. That's a life-giving idea that says, and you'll see the signs that say literally, we close on Sunday so that our families of our employees can worship together. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, I clap for them. And you can clap for their chicken and sweet tea. My point is this. We have got to be men and women and students that raise the bar for the people around us, that bring life to the people around us. I say it very simply. When life flows, influence grows. It's that simple. Have you not been attracted to men and women, leaders who have gained influence simply because they are pouring life into those around them, right? We say this at our events. We pray this as a team. Our prayer is that grace flows from our stage and is not required for our stage. Does that make sense? In other words, if we stink at what we do, if you've, you've been to a, a, a concert or you've been to a, a game or whatever and something went wrong, in a sense that requires something from you, doesn't it? Or the singer was really bad and nobody wanted to address it, right? It's the pastor's sister or something. And, but the, we have a responsibility to let grace flow from us and not be required from us. And the number of us that have leaders that don't recognize that who have constantly taken grace from us because they're leading so poorly that day in and day out, and I'm not attracted to a leader like that. What I'm attracted to is a leader that says, you know what? I'm gonna give you what I have. I'm gonna pour out my life for you. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. John Maxwell said that years ago. Um, so back to this concept of being unique. In 2009, a lady named Bronnie Ware was a hospice nurse in Australia. And she spent seven years asking questions to the people that were dying at the, on their deathbed. And the question she asked them was, what is your biggest regret in life? What, what would you think that might be? Um, you know, I wore too many clothes. I don't, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Sometimes, you guys, you're going to find out God has uniquely gifted me at something. But I haven't quite figured it out yet. I, I think, I, when I read it, I remember thinking, okay, I work too much. I didn't make enough money. Like those are the regrets that most of us would consider. Listen to what she, she found. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Whew. This was the most common regret of all. When people realize that their life is almost over and look back clearly on it, it's easy to see how many dreams have gone unfulfilled most people had not honored even half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to the choices they had made or not made. Their number one regret was, I was not true to myself. That should wake all of us up a little bit this morning. That for seven years she asked man after woman 
after man, after woman who was on their dying bed, what do you regret most in life? And they said, I was never who I knew I was supposed to be. I was never who I wanted to be because I let my circumstances and my surroundings and the people in my life affect that. That's not a good way to live. And I don't want any of us, can we learn from that? I don't want any of us to get to the end of that time and have that same feeling. And I know some of you right now are going, I got time. I'm 16, I'm 22. You never know. But here's what I do know is your legacy starts right now. My 10-year-old, we just got a call. My wife told me this yesterday. Our, um, count, the, the counselor at the school called her because my 10-year-old had noticed a boy in his class wears the same clothes every day and that they bring him in a bag lunch. And he went to him and said, Mr. Wheeler, can I do something? Can I bring him something? Can I get him some food? My 10-year-old recognizes that influence that he can have on somebody else's life. And he was choosing in that moment to go, I want to be life-giving. So I'm telling you, if you're in here and you're 10, get after it. It's go time. If you're 70, it's still go time. One of my closest friends is in his mid-70s, and he circled a group of us guys up one time, and he said, you know what? When I go out, I want the tank to be on empty. He has not put a pause on this life. So no matter where you are in the spectrum, we have a choice, and our choice is to be life-giving. So I want to jump into a scripture here. Uh, our, our dear friend, King David, was kind of a train wreck. He would uh, one day be one of the greatest leaders in the, the world has ever seen, and the next moment make massive mistake. And yet he's the one that God said, he's a man after my own heart. How about that? So those of you that feel like, God, can you still be with me? Yeah. Listen to King David. So King David wrote Psalm 139, which to me is such a foundational truth around this conversation that we're going to have. Listen to what he says in, in the beginning of this verse or this chapter. He says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you, even from a distance. You know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. It's kind of creepy. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm gonna say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there. I look up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, it's too wonderful. I cannot take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Some of you just needed to hear that today. I have a group of guys that I mentor, and one of the guys said this week, but when I sin, does it that separate me from God? No. That's what it says right here. And that's a conversation for another day. But some of us, that's probably a little bit eye-opening that, wait a minute, God, you were there? <laughs> Wait, you were in that situation that I was just in that I shouldn't have been in? It's a little scary if we're turning from the Lord or we're, we're trying to do things that may be not pleasing uh, to our families and to the Lord. But for those of us that constantly go, are you with me? He says in Psalm 139, I am so with you. Everywhere you turn, my spirit is there with you. For us, it's an awareness. It's such a wonderful thought. David moves on to say this. I love this passage. I'm telling you, this is where I want you to hear it today. Oh, yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. Y'all feel that? Not every day body, right? What if God wants to remind you? It says in the New Testament, you are a masterpiece. Maybe God just wants to remind you that you are marvelously made. It's a good word. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I even lived one day. God formed you. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm just going to read this to you. David wrote, you shape me inside and out. Do you believe that? Let me ask you, when the last time you didn't like something about your personality? So as you can tell, I have a little bit of a uniqueness. I am uh, really funny and good looking, and that's very unique for a lot of people. Um, 
I love the idea that God uniquely made me for a unique purpose. Did you, did you hear that in the scripture where it said, with all the days of my life spread out before me, you knit me together. You made me from nothing into something while looking at the scope of my life. Leaders, how many people do you know that spend their life chasing other people's uniquenesses, chasing other people's gift sets, other people's talents, other people's relationships. Uh, I, I introduced a really good friend to an amazing song called Jesse's Girl one time. And in the middle of Jesse's Girl, he goes, wait a second, he wants Jesse's Girl? Yes, and that's weird. But you understand my point. We covet so many things that aren't for us, including personality, including uniqueness, including influence. I, um, I really, one of the most important leadership moments in my life came around the same concept. I was a uh, pastor at a church, was there for about uh, 14 months, and me and the lead pastor there, uh, we weren't a great fit, to say the least. You ever, you ever been in a situation where it's not that anybody's doing something terrible, it's just it's, there's ten, it just doesn't fit. You're trying to make it work, but chemistry's not there. And uh, so I go, uh, did that, I was moving on to a new church, and it was a church within our network of churches, and, and he, he said, hey, you know what, on your last day, let's do an evaluation. Now, let me just say, that's not a great idea because he wasn't wanting to do a back and forth evaluation. He just wanted to give me his thoughts on what I probably could have done better. And I knew he had a few. And so we sit down at lunch and he literally had typed up this entire evaluation of me and went through it. And uh, my uh, spiritual gift in that moment was to be quiet because... <laughs> That was not going to turn out well. And it wasn't worth it at the, end, at the end of the day. God had called me somewhere else. He needed somebody that fit better with him. So we get to the end of the lunch, and he pushes the paper over to the side. He says, you know, Tyler, I've got one more major concern. And in my mind, I'm going, shocker. Um, <laughs> this is overwhelming to me. Um, and this is what he said to me. He said, Tyler, if you are not successful at the next place, don't blame the organization. It's probably just your personality. You laugh, I wasn't. <laughs> in that moment, well, that was one of the most painful things that somebody could say to you. Basically is that, you know, it's like, it's not you, it's me. I'm like, okay, you're right. But I thought three things in that moment. Number one, he had just shirked responsibility for our whole relationship, which is fine. Number two, I thought of two of the six people that started the church I was going to that, you know, um, had grown to 50,000 people on Sunday. So those two, wired very similar to me, had been quite successful. So I thought of those two people. But the third one is exactly what we're talking about, and it's what changed my life forever. The third one was, if Psalm 139 is true, then what you say right now is saying that God has made a mistake, that he has given me a person. Now, he, he knit me together. That's what we just said. We just read. He, he knit me together. He put me together in my mother's womb while looking at my life of floundering, of not being good at stuff, of not being able to lead simply because I have a unique personality set. And I don't believe that's true. What I do believe is true is that God knit me together for a unique purpose, a purpose that requires and encourages flourishing and life. We do not serve a scarce, floundering God. We serve an abundant, life-giving, absolutely amazing, marvelous God. And that uniqueness that he put within me is so closely tied to what I'm gifted to do. So I, before I was leading Catalyst, I really um, got my wings, if you will, on producing events and uh, production, music, those sorts of things. And um, there's a right path assessment, which is a personality assessment I do with my team. And what's the funniest part is the thing that made the chemistry with me and him really not work was uh, when you take the right path, there's one side for structured and there's another side for unstructured. And the side for unstructured doesn't have any lines on it. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just going to break it to you. I'm kind of on this spectrum. I'm a little bit unstructured. And when that assessment first came out, one side had attributes. So the attributes for structured people was precise, organized, and achieving. But for a long time, that assessment did not have attributes on the other side. So you'd say, I'm really low and precise, I'm really low and organized, whatever. But when they finally came out and put attributes on the other side, it made it very clear to me why I was good at the unique thing God was calling me to do. 
was I was really, and I wasn't high in precise, I was really high in improv and instinct. So when I'm in a room with 10,000 people and a projector goes bad, I don't freak out. Matter of fact, I didn't plan for anything anyway. No, I'm just kidding. I do plan for some. <laughs> but here's what I can tell you. I come alive in those moments. I come alive. Because I'm uniquely made for moments just like that. And that is what made me a good producer. That has continued to give me opportunity after opportunity to continue to grow influence and, and continue to serve the church in the way I do. So the very thing that created tension with me and this other guy was the very thing that God wanted to use. And if I had listened to him, and if you continue to listen to the people around you that are telling you that you need to act, operate, and be a certain way, the life-giving flow is gonna get cut off. You were made uniquely for a unique purpose. We cannot divorce the two. Why, would, why in the world would God uniquely make you and make you do something that doesn't match that? How many CPAs or accountants in the room? Anybody? There you go, I see you, a couple. We praise Jesus for you, we are thankful for you. Right, everybody thankful for, for CPAs and accountants? If I'm in Excel more than 17 seconds, <laughs> it's not a good scenario. But I have to do it. But let me tell you what nobody in this room wants, me to become an accountant or a CPA. Fair enough? I do it all by napkin math. <laughs> your design and your influence cannot be separated. There is no question we have to continue to grow as leaders, but we have to continue to get better at the core of who we were created to be. God did not make a mistake when he gave you the talent you covet in somebody else. He did not, or when he didn't give you that, he did not make a mistake we will reject the lie that any of us were designed in error. Instead, we'll believe that God is the greatest designer. You were created, your creator created you for something. Your design is connected to that purpose. There is a tension when you lead different than that. I'm gonna do a little exercise here. Uh, I, need, I need a volunteer who is not musical. Okay, I see you, sir, come on up here. This is not karaoke, so uh, you're going the wrong direction. Oh, you can't get down here that way. We'll make it quick, I, I'm running out of time. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna have him play this little thing called a guitar. It's actually not called that. That's not even Southern. I have really hauled off on my Southern talking today. I didn't say fixin', I didn't say y'all. But when I was in seminary in Boston, they would say like, say y'all. Come on up. You still feel like you're kind of meandering up here. Let's get some speed to this thing. Okay, have you ever played guitar before? Nope. All right, this is perfect. Don't break it. Okay, that's, you're holding it. There we go, all right. What's your name? Nick. Everybody say, hey, Nick. Nick. All right, so Nick, do you know what this is? Pick. There you go, Nick, it rhymes with pick. Here we go, uh, so I want you to take that and uh, just play us something, Nick. You have held a guitar before at least once. Oh, that's beautiful, Nick. Give it, uh, play us uh, like a GCD kind of chord progression or something. We, I hope we're recording this. We can, make, we can make money off of this. How do you feel right now, Nick? Yeah, I can tell by the way you came down here. You ain't feeling a whole lot. It's, uh, you just, I like this. You, my son, Charlie, are the same person. I was like, life's good. I'm just chilling. And that shirt is fantastic. Okay, everybody say thank you, Nick. Thank you. Good job, Nick. I'm gonna hand this to somebody that knows how, that plays this consistently. Now here's before, um, before she plays this. This was designed uniquely to be played a certain way. Did you feel the tension when he was playing in a way counter to how it was designed? Did you feel that? I felt it. He didn't feel it, but we felt it. <laughs> uh, Taylor guitars have a patent on their, the neck of the guitar. It's so uniquely made to make a unique sound, but if you do not know how to play it, it makes it sound counter to what it's supposed to sound like. This is what this guitar should sound like. Does that sound a little better? Great job. Before you can be life-giving, you have to quit chasing other people's sound 
and their uniqueness. You were uniquely designed for a unique purpose. That guitar doesn't work when it's played wrong. There's tension, it, it hurts, it's painful, and you're sitting there cheering for the person or the guitar to go, oh, I know it could be so much better than that. Do any of you have somebody in your life that you're sitting here going, I know you could be so much better than that, but you've gotten lost in circumstance, you've gotten lost in your environment, you've gotten lost in being the big man on campus or, or being the boss that you don't think you can give life to the people around you. But here's what I will tell you. You will have a following the rest of your life when you choose to give life to the people around you, when you choose to pour into them and to invest in them. Here's why this matters to me. I don't know very many people that have walked away from Jesus because of Jesus. But I know a whole lot of people. We would say in the South, a slew of them who have walked away from faith in Jesus because of those of us that represent Jesus. Because we, as believers, as followers of Jesus, are not living in a life that is life-giving. We're separating our faith from our day. What would it look like to raise up a, a church of people that go into prayer, into meetings, business meetings, in a prayerful mindset saying, Lord, what do you wanna do in this meeting and how can I serve the people around me? Imagine a community filled with men and women who have embraced the fact that they are life-giving in what they can do and that they have the life-giver in them. And in their school as a teacher, they start pouring life into the people around them, the students. One of the greatest mentors of my entire life has been teaching high school technology education for 38 years. And he mentored me when I'd just become a believer and as a public school teacher, he's not supposed to do that. But he poured his life into me. And it changed who I am. And it made me see that no matter where I sit, whatever seat I am on the bus, I have an opportunity to love and care and pour life into the people around me. 